cheers. I hope everyone has a glass ready. I think we all need it <laughs> this year. Yep, I think yep. it was the perfect time to talk about bubbles. It's the holidays. This year has been a very, very long year. I think bubbles are much needed. So I hope we can all cheers and raise a toast for this year being over into 2021 to the hospitality industry. May we persist. Yeah, but you're good. You got your stickers, so you shouldn't cry. Otherwise, don't worry about it. You got your stickers. Oh, I love Zoom. So, yes, as Margie said, I was her teacher's assistant for two very amazing years, and I wish I could keep doing it, but as all jobs happen, you move on. I also worked at a wine retail shop for two years and at a wine marketing company, so fully immersed. I absolutely love the wine industry. I went to Collins thinking I was going to go into events. Turned 21 that day. We had a master sommelier on campus. And I said, well, okay, I think I'm going to pivot a little bit here. And I fell in deep. I took my intro SOM exam a month after turning 21 and kept going from there. And I'm a certified sommelier, a certified specialist in wine. And I'm currently going back to school to get my MBA, Sonoma State, with an emphasis in wine. So I'm just going to keep rolling through that education. I love to learn. I love to teach. And that's why wine is perfect. You learn something new about wine every single day. And that's what makes it so great. And one of my favorite styles of wine is sparkling wine. It's bubbly. It's fun. It's for celebrations. It's for any time, to be honest, which I wish people understood a little more, but it's just, it's so great. And it really takes in all the senses and fits all the foods. It's absolutely fantastic. It fits my personality. So we'll start from there. So what I love about sparkling wine, it truly is made all over the world with a variety of crates. And to kind of kick us off, it really starts off making, you have about six different methods you can use to make sparkling wine. And ultimately they all make a different style of bubbly and each have kind of different levels of carbonation in them. So these six methods are the traditional method, otherwise known as the method champenoise, as is used for champagne, cava, cremant in Spain, Francia Corta, all over the world as well. Uh, there's also the tank method, also known as the Charmat method, which is used for most Prosecco, as well as German sex. There's also the transfer method, the partial fermentation method, also known as Asti method, like is used with this bottle of Moscato di Asti. There's also the ancestral method, which actually predates the champagne method and carbonation, which is the cheapest and easiest way of producing sparkling wine. That's the type of wine that at weddings, if you know they aren't wine people and they offer you a bottle and you're like, mm, it's okay, I'll have water or gin and tonic. Maybe, maybe not that, <laughs> maybe not my best. Thank you, Albert, for the laugh. I appreciate that. <laughs> So to start off, we're gonna talk about the champagne method, about this traditional method and really kind of dig a little bit into the region. And we all know champagne is just such a luxurious and celebrated beverage in the world. But the truth is it really started off with some unexpected beginnings. Um, a long time ago, around the 15th century, they really were making just still wines. They were trying to compete with Burgundy. They were trying to make Pinot Noir, Chardonnay, still wine. They were just too cold of a region to be able to really do that. And as I mentioned, in the 15th century, weather got so cold in the Northern Hemisphere that the yeast started to go dormant. So all of a sudden fermentation would stop. But winemakers didn't really have a way of kind of gauging whether the wine was done. So they're like, okay, we're all done. We're set, we're good to go. So they bottled or put the wines into containers. But then when spring rolled around, temperatures rose back up, fermentation would start again. And so because unlike in just that single fermentation, when normally you can have all those CO2 bubbles escape, stays in the bottle. And unfortunately, since the bottles were not that well made, often what happens is these bottles would explode. So these winemakers would go down to the cellars and they would probably have to wear hazmat suits out of just fear that these bottles are gonna blow up all over them. So this was a huge problem for the winemaking community. And over the years, they solved this issue. They found new ways of bottles. They figured out how to kind of hold that pressure into the bottle 
they started adding punts into the bottle, bottom of the bottle to kind of withstand that pressure. And they really found ways to control the bubbles in the wine. And then the issue is also is that the land saw so many wars, they saw had so much hardship. But today, Champagne is a multi-million dollar industry. There are 32 million cases produced per year and it makes about 18% of the world's sparkling wine production. And as many of us know, champagne can only come from Champagne, France, even though sometimes your friends might say, oh, we're having champagne tonight. Doesn't always mean it's gonna be champagne, but to legally be called champagne as we look in Champagne, France, very northern, cold, cold, cold. It's one of the most northern quality winemaking regions in the world. But this is why it's so perfect for sparkling wine. With sparkling wine, you usually want your base wine to be low alcohol and that high acidity so you can keep that effervescence and that racy, just beautiful bubbles in your mouth. And now champagne, there are three main grapes that are used in the region. So Chardonnay, Pinot Noir, and Pinot Meunier, otherwise now just known as Meunier. There are four other grapes that can be used, but in such small quantities that they aren't often talked about. So now the important part, how to make champagne. This is always the fun part because it has so many steps. So what's great is it all starts out basically like a white wine. You make your base wine, which they call Vin Clairs in the region, and they ferment it to about 10% alcohol. They can then blend this wine. Wine, wine makers will choose to um, blend this wine depending on what they want. They can do various pressings, different varieties, vineyards, vintages, truly whatever the winemaker chooses. And this art of blending is called the assemblage and they eventually blend it all into what is called the cuvee. Then when it comes time to start that second fermentation, they place a mixture of yeast and sugar in the bottle called the liqueur de tirage. They stick a temporary crown cap on top, basically just looks like a little beer cap. And it's fit with a bedule, which is a gathering place for the sediment that will come out of the second fermentation. And then during the second fermentation, this wine is rested on its side. And this is the process is when the little yeasty start to eat the sugar, CO2 and alcohol is produced. So the CO2 that comes out, since it can't escape out of the bottle, it is absorbed into the wine, as well as the alcohol percentage during the second fermentation will raise about one to one and a half percent as well. And during this time, the yeast will eat the sugar, but eventually they'll start to die and decompose. This is what gives those amazing nutty brioche flavors and aromas that you really get in a fantastic champagne. And the longer that the wine sits horizontally, with those leaves, with those dead yeast, the longer you're gonna get, the more those aromas are really gonna come through. It's just so perfect. And usually for vintage champagnes, you'll have them sit even just a little bit longer. And so unfortunately, I don't have a really good example to show you kind of how the dead yeast form. So I have a knockoff 315 prop with me. It's just water and salt in the bottle. You can kind of see how they want those dead yeast cells to kind of sit on the bottle. Now, at least I'm the only one holding this since in 315, we'd always tell people, please do not turn the bottle vertically. You'll ruin it for everyone else and they can't see it. But ultimately there was some student probably in the first class and like the second row, they'd be like, what? I wasn't listening and then turn it all the way and then ruin it for the entire class. So this one's just for me, it's, it's not as good, but you can kind of see how those yeast will sit on the bottom of the bottle. Now, we don't always call it dead yeast. That's not the most attractive thing if you're at a restaurant and you're like, oh ma'am, would you like the champagne with, the, with that sat on the dead yeast for a long time? It's not the most attractive thing to say. I don't think anyone's going, yeah, I really like that wine. You go, no, so we say surly on the leaves or say spent yeast. It sounds so, so much better. So we're gonna go with that. But then the problem is, okay, we well, don't wanna drink all these dead yeast cells. How do we get rid of it? So in the 19th century, there's somewhat of a story here. We don't know how much of this is true or not, but I still think it's kind of fun. Um, Madame Veuve Clicquot, was a, who was a widow at the time, and took over her husband's house, was kind of walking, walking through the house and saw her dining room table and said, 
well, what if I just cut that in half and kind of kind of link them together and put some holes holes in there and maybe like 60 holes and then just stuck some wine bottles inside of it. There's still wine in that bottle. Okay. And just stuck some wine in there. And go, okay. And then slowly figure out how to turn the bottle from horizontal to sir point to exactly vertical. And that's that's exactly what she invented. So this um, procedure is called riddling. And what it is, is that the bottles are placed horizontal and with quarter turns, they're slowly turned, shaken, and all the way till they're upright. And these bottles can even sit upright for quite a bit of time after as well. So, okay, now we have all these on the bottom of the next, they're all sitting there ready to go. Now we gotta get rid of them. So this process is called disgorging, which often is done by getting a really, really frozen, like a briny liquor, liquor, liquor and then sticking the bottom of the bottle, the neck in the bottle in that mixture. Open up that top pot cork, out comes that just sludge of yeast and you have your clean champagne. Unfortunately, some volume is lost, especially if you do this by hand without using the mixture, you'll lose some, some volume of the wine and you never wanna lose champagne. You don't wanna serve a bottle of champagne that only has a little bit in it. So the winemaker will then top off this bottle with a level of wine. And this also gives the opportunity for the winemaker to add a little bit of sugar to the wine, just to give it some balance. You can absolutely not add any sugar. This is also called non-dosage, whatever you wanna call it. it. It's just, it's fantastic. It's very austere, but it does not fit every style. So often we'll add some sugar to the wine. And in Champagne, the average kind of level is zero to 12 grams per liter of residual sugar. And this is called brute. So you'll often see that on the label. And just for some reference, Coca-Cola has over hundred grams per liter of sugar. So this is not making the wine sweet. It's just giving it a nice balance. Then once that's all set, wine is good to go. Seal that cork up, seal that bottle up with a nice cork, usually pretty, a large cork. Once it's in there, the pressure is what makes it so mushroom shaped. I was trying to find a winery to ask for some corks. I didn't have the time, I'm busy, but <laughs> I was able to at least show you this, pop off, close with a mousselet, this little cork right there, and your wine is good to go. <sighs> Takes a while to talk about, but it is absolutely delicious and absolutely worth it. And the wine here I have today to represent Champagne is the Agripark Champagne uh, Grand Cru Terroirs Blanc de Blanc Brut. So Blanc de Blanc just means white to white, which means all white grapes were used. In this case, all Chardonnay grapes. And this wine is a grower producer, which means that all of the grapes came from the estate vineyards. And most of the wineries we know from Champagne are negotiants, which means often what they'll do is they'll purchase the wines from different houses or other locations. Not always they can have their own, but I decided to kind of feature something a little different. So this is one of my favorites. I love the agar part. It's been aged on the leaves for four years. It has those amazing kind of brioche biscuity notes, amazing kind of yellow apple, just tart fruit, it's absolutely amazing. But I'd love to hear if any of you are drinking some traditional champagne, champagne, traditional style, anyone out there? Nobody? No, Moscato. That works. It's bubbles, I love it. Yes, it's good. Pink Moscato I had, but I finished that. <laughs> <laughs> As you should finish it. That's what bubbles are made to do, made to finish. This will shock you, I'm drinking Rotor Estate. No. Very nice, very nice. Always approve. All the way back from my Four Seasons days, you know, Ben, what was the house sparkling of uh, Ritz Carlton? What are you drinking? You have to unmute. <laughs> Oh, I'm having a um, barefoot. Gee, what are you having? Ben, what are you having? 
I'm having the Prosecco from, I think it's from the RKR or from the wine class. Oh, nice. Well, thank you for supporting our effort. I appreciate that. Oh, it's such an effort. But <laughs> Hi, Hank. Hello, Ben. Hello. Hello. Okay, well, since everyone has Prosecco, I guess we can kind of move, in, move on to talk about the next method of sparkling wine that I'm going to focus on today. So, as you guys have, Prosecco, most of it is made via the tank method, also known as the Charmant method, bulk method, however you want to say it. And unfortunately, this method has a like just a bad rep for being a cheaper way of making wine. And that's not champagne. It's not supposed to be champagne. It's supposed to be something completely different. Because ultimately, although they both are sparkling wines, they're not to, meant to be the same thing. They're supposed to be consumed in different ways. So what's great about this is you usually want to use it for aromatic varieties, thinking muscat, Riesling, because you really want to emphasize those useful, those floral, those fruity aromas. You don't want to cover those up by all those yeasty aromas you're going to get from sitting on the leaves. And what's even the best thing about this production method, it's cheaper. So you can pump them out faster and you don't have to pay so much per bottle. So same idea when you're making the wine, you take the base wine and this time, instead of putting it in the bottle for the second fermentation, you stick it inside a pressurized tank and you add the yeast and the sugar there and everything ferments under pressure. Once fermentation is done, you rack it all off to a second tank. And just to kind of remove the sediment, dosage is added to the entire batch and you bottle the wine. A lot less steps, a lot simpler. You could just skip that riddling and disgorging all set. So the region I'm gonna talk about to kind of display this method is Conoliano Val de Bialdenet Prosecco Secure DOCG. And because I don't have a PowerPoint and can't show you guys exactly how to say it, because often even people in the industry get confused, I did put this out here just so we can kind of spell it out together. In Italy, you pronounce all of the letters. So to say it slowly, it's Conigliano Valdo Biadene. So Conigliano Valdo Biadene Prosecco Spire D-O-C-G. It's really fun when you get to teach a whole class on this and say it multiple, multiple times. But you get used to it. So pretty much to simplify Italian wine law, D-O-C-G is just a small designated region inside of Italy. It is located in Northeast Italy in the hilly Provence of Treviso. It's about an hour north of Venice and right below the Dolomite Mountains. And now you might see, if you're in wine, you'll see the name Sipiore and you think, oh, Sipiore, I learned that. It means that there's a higher alcohol percentage than a normale wine. Nope, not for this region, not for Prosecco Sipiore. They mean it in the American way, which is we're better than you. We're better than the DOC, <laughs> which to be honest, they did really earn that name. This region has such a natural vocation for viticulture. It is built on such hilly slopes and has a wide variety of soils. And again, just because this is so beautiful, you have to see this image. These slopes are so steep. We always talk about Collins calves having to walk up that hill to get to class. These are Conigliano calves. That's how you get a workout. That is a lot steeper. I think I would enjoy being in that region. I would have a good workout. Although maybe about halfway, like, mm, okay, I need a bottle of Prosecco now. I think I need a little break. But because of their amazing viticulture and their terroir there, in 2019, they were actually granted, they are now in a UNESCO World Heritage Site. So they are forever there. And because of this, all of their grapes have to be handpicked. There's no machinery going through there. And one of my favorite facts about the region is that 40% of the winemakers are under 40 years old and 40% of the winemakers are women. <sighs> Took people long enough to start getting there. So very happy on that one. And now the main grape of Prosecco is Glera. About 85% of Glera has to be used, but other indigenous and international varietals can be used as well. And for Prosecco, the 
residual sugar is usually a little higher. Their average is called extra dry, which is 12 to 17 grams per liter of sugar. So it has that little kick, that little punch, which I think makes it perfect as an aperitivo, just to kind of have it with like snacks, like cheeses, like I set up in front of me so I can snack and eat in case I get hungry. And the bottle I have today is the Ruggieri Justino B Extra Dry. It definitely has those amazing kind of apples in it, yellow apples, pears, honeysuckle, floral, aromatic, light 11% alcohol. This is the wine that you have out when you're kind of snacking and you're cooking. You go through the whole bottle while you're cooking. And then you see you have something different while you eat. You can open another bottle of Prosecco. But it's absolutely delicious. So James, I saw you were pairing your Prosecco earlier with your burger and fries. It was, it was great with in and out <laughs> I can imagine. Like, I mean, sparkling wines, because of their, like, brilliance, brilliant combination of just their effervescence, their ample acidity, and their lower alcohol, they're perfect for food pairings. And just kind of matching that, I mean, the greasiness, the fried food, the butter, it's perfect. It's exactly what you'll pair. I can't eat any of that food, but I can imagine that they pair really well together. <laughs> Anyone else drinking some Prosecco or other wine tonight? No, but we're having vodkas with our uh, sparkling. Nice, very nice, as you should. Kristen, I actually yeah. picked out the same bottle that you were talking about. Nice. <laughs> Trader Joe's, it was a great price. That works. I mean, that's what's so great about Prosecco Superiore. It really doesn't cost a lot of money. You can get fantastic bottles for $15 to $30 at Tops. And that's what makes it so nice. You'll spend a little more money. I mean, champagne's expensive, worth it sometimes, but it really depends on your price point and kind of what you're, what you're going for. I mean, you're not going to want to pair your Prosecco with your buttery lobster dinner, but always worth a shot. I love, I mean, any sparkling wine with like just tart fruit, raw fish is amazing. Champagne with breakfast. I mean, if you have the wine, it tastes like buttery biscuits. Why would you not want to pair that with your eggs and just kind of enjoy your morning? So you might kind of see here that I also have different types of stemware out. And the thing is you can really drink your wine in any type of stems you like. Sometimes the wine industry gets very picky on a lot of topics, rightfully so, but I think it's kind of fun to have to have your options. So a lot of people kind of recognize that classic flute. This is perfect. It'll keep your wine chilled, your bubbles going up. It's great if you're going to be standing for a long time, doing a lot of wedding toast, but you don't really get much aroma out of it. So not always the best if you really want to smell and get a lot of your wine. The historic coupe is the exact opposite. All the aromas just come on out of it, but the bubbles dissipate pretty quickly. This is fantastic if you're a fast sparkling wine drinker, which no judgment, we all do it, but <laughs> probably better, best used when there was still yeast sediment in there and you were just like, okay, I just gotta get this down as fast as possible. Not always the most ideal glass. So then normally my go-tos are the tulip glass, which just kind of opens up a little more. The kind of bigger the bowl, the more oxygen can really kind of integrate with the wine and you kind of get the nose out of there. Or just a white wine glass or a universal wine glass. I mean, I'm kind of loving having just one glass. It takes up less room in your cabinet. You get to be less picky when someone goes over. Like, it's just that one. You don't have to like go maybe that and that one and that one. It's all good, just, just one. Bubbles still come out, stays cool, and you really can get the aromas out of there as well. In fact, now a lot of wine regions, especially the consortio of Conoliano, Valdebella, Prosecco, Severo, ID, OCG, really prefer you not to use a flute. Uh, I was told that actually specifically from them. I tried to take a photo with flutes and they went, no, 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 we don't, we don't do flutes. Like, okay, but whatever works for you, it's fine. A lot of times in wine, it's whatever makes you happy. You are the expert of your own palate. No one can tell you, hey, that's not good. You're not gonna like that. Well, how, how do you know? You're not gonna know until you try. So it really depends on how much of the formality you kind of wanna fit with your wine. 
kind of just kind of wanted to wrap it up, just kind of talk about wine. I'm happy to go through other methods. I can show you guys all how to open a bottle, but I really just kind of want to have open conversation about bubbles. I love bubbles. It's December. I miss talking to people. Um, I could have done a lengthy PowerPoint, but I figured we were kind of all sick of Zoom PowerPoints. I just finished up classes and after watching two accounting classes after video, after Zoom videos, like, you know, I, I think I think we're all done of PowerPoints. I think it'd kind of be more fun just to kind of have a nice open conversation about about bubbles. There's no happier topic. I I love bubbles. I love sparkling wine. So please, like, unmute yourself. I'm happy to talk about anything else. What do you guys got? So Kristen, we've had a lot of talented alumni on this series, and Ray Bishop showed us how to fabricate a bunch of things with barbecue. Mm -hmm. Tell me what sparkling wine would you drink with some of that fabulous barbecue that Ray recommended? I mean, it's probably whiskey, but. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh man. I mean, it kind of depends on, are you gonna put heavy barbecue sauce on it? Or are you just gonna eat it right out? I mean, that's kind of always the biggest decision. It's really like what you're gonna have on it. Cause honestly, I think all would kind of Go with it. I mean, that's what's so great about bubbles is they can pair with everything. You do have to be careful with darker meat. I would probably go with a rosé. Even, let's see here, one of my favorites, the Domaine Carneros Brut Rosé is absolutely delicious. It'll be able to kind of stand up to a lot of the darker meats when you have kind of that Pinot Noir in it, it'll have a little more body, a little more of that fruitiness. And I think that would pair amazing with barbecue. I'm a little biased. I do love Domaine Fernandez and Rotor. Maybe I'm a little biased to a lot of these guys, but absolutely delicious. One of, one of my favorites. Ben wants to know what you're drinking on New Year's Eve. <laughs> Actually last year, I drank a lot of Rotor Estate. This year, I actually have a bottle, speaking of Domaine Carneros, of Domaine Carneros Florev chilling in my fridge. So I'm excited to open that one. I actually have a bottle of their 1992 Lorev for an event we did. I have an extra bottle. It's actually older than me, so I'm excited to actually open that bottle up and try it out. So always something good. So how do you make sparkling wine convenient? Lynch has posted an article that he wrote about the convenience factor. And he's actually posting something that you wrote when you took his marketing class in 2016. That's the danger of having faculty on this call. No. So, so what's sure. convenient about sparkling wine? But it was fun. I think it was fun. And, and um, so I think it's a good time to um, drink a little bit for your, I'm glad to see you also on campus all the time with Margie. You can't keep me away from that campus. I will <laughs> always be there. That working with all of you and being at Collins has been so fun for me to do. I found sparkling wine really at a time where, where I needed a passion. I always love hospitality, I love people, but that last year at Collins, my mom uh, was diagnosed with breast cancer and she was okay. fighting it for two years and she's all, she's good now, better in remission, which I'm so happy, but wine yeah. really like was my passion. I put everything I had to it and Collins was, was my family and really helped support me during that time. So I am happy to always come back and help I can't wait to when I get to come and teach again, when we get to be back in person. I know I have a couple students waiting to take some exams. I'm just like, hang on, I'll do as much as I can now, but we'll hang tight. So I'm always excited to, to come back and share with you guys. Alia, you said you actually um, study MBA, also focus on why? Yeah, so right now I'm going to Sonoma State. I just started this fall for their MBA program and there's an emphasis in wine, which is absolutely so fantastic. It's a two year program. So hopefully I'll get to eventually take wine classes in person next fall. 
I'm trying really hard to be optimistic. That's my thing. I'm optimistic. So I'm just going to keep smiling and grinning and drinking. I think all lots. CSU, we just got the update saying uh, all CSU going to have in-person class in the fall 2021. So I, I also hear some positive uh, update about the vaccine. So hopefully that will be we, making we, sure everybody's okay when we come back in the fall. I, we we, we shall see. Oh, okay. so it's, yeah. So it's not um it's not online class. You you um in Sonoma State, it's all um it's it's like your MBA is face to face. No, nope, we're online. Nothing is more fun than learning accounting online at 9 p.m. at night. <laughs> Well, but then we can keep you here when it's online. Otherwise, you will actually go up and then you're not getting close and cannot come back for our events. Well, there you go. Then I guess there is a good reason for everything. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> well, I let other people ask you questions. <laughs> Thank you for sharing. Of course. I miss talking to people. The only time I get to see people is on Zoom. So... I'll take what I can get. <laughs> I see that Oscar is here with you. So maybe you should talk for a minute about kind of the bond of uh, passage to uh, create experiences with uh, certifications or studying for tests and things. Because I think that when I see the names here, everybody has a buddy that got them through accounting or got them through everything. So Oscar and Kristen spent many days in the boardroom getting ready for their SOM exams and, and their 315 exams. And uh, where, what were you drinking and what were you enjoying and what's different now? What do we do right that makes life easier in the COVID world? Oh man, I mean, I was drinking white Zinfandel with my mom before I took 315. I truly, I grew up in a beer family. My dad has been a home brewer for over 10 years. I had no idea what I was getting into. I just remember I was in Association of Beverage Professionals there for beer. This guy called Albert, like, hey, I'm like, we're gonna, we're gonna study for the SOM exam. You wanna do that? It's like, okay, sounds good. He put together these amazing, that's a very polite way of saying it, very simple, no. He put together these PowerPoints <laughs> to try to help us study. Yeah, 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 he tried. All this stuff was great. Yeah, it was great. <laughs> but we all got to be together. And that's that's what made it so fun is we, you know, had together a Wine Wednesday tasting group. Yeah, that was good. It was good. And I learned so much taking exam and just being being in class and trying everything as well. I mean, we all kind of had like our aha moment there. I mean, in 315, I never tried most of the varietals that we went through and I was like, oh my gosh, you know, like on food pairing day when, you know, you try things like try it with a little salt and then try it with the cream cheese that Ernie bought way too much of and had like a whole packet. Yeah. You know, that's that's how you learn. I mean, learn by doing, well, learn by drinking, honestly. It's, it's a weird way of saying it, but it's true. You really have to get out there and just start tasting and start learning. And it helps to have a buddy. It helps to be with somebody else and go along with the ride. I prefer learn by tasting. <laughs> it depends how long you've been through the night. It starts by learn by tasting. Sometimes it veers off at the end. Yeah. <laughs> Not on campus. That's the beauty. Not on campus. Absolutely. Never, never on campus. Uh, Kristen, I did have a question. I, uh, I am fairly new in the wine world and I was curious, how do you open a bottle of uh, said sparkling or champagne or Prosecco? Well, thank you, Albert. Good. I was getting a little thirsty and I did kind of want some rosé. So I appreciate that question. <laughs> so as you can see, I did kind of have this wine chilling off to the side. This is my delicious Domaine Carneros Brut Rosé from the Carneros region located in both Napa and Sonoma. So it's split in between ones. So with sparkling wine, depending on how fancy you want to be, you can either find that pull tab and just rip it off, or you can use your wine key and go around. So I always try to show both versions because you don't want to 
like overly trying to do it table side. This table's slightly wobbly and I do not want to lose all my lines. So, but you basically just want to cut that foil off and you go around. You just want to get that top part off and really just kind of peel off the top of this one. I'm going to throw it below me because I do not have pockets because for some reason in women's jeans, they do not make pockets. They make thick pockets. Can never understand that one. You can place your serviette on top of the bottle and each wire cage is closed with six half turns. So you just go six half turns, loosen that up a little bit. Make sure the whole time that your thumb is on top of the cork. That thing can come out so fast. There's about five to seven pressures of atmosphere in there. You don't want that going through, especially during the holidays. I, I don't want to accidentally break the Christmas tree, break the window, I'd be in trouble. <laughs> so you want to hold your bottle at about a 45 degree angle and then just start twisting the bottom of the bottle. You want to slowly twist, keep that hand, keep that pressure on top of that cork and you just keep twisting the bottle until it just slightly makes a fizz. I, it's often fun to have the big pop, but you don't want all the CO2 escaping that quickly. Take the top off and you're all set. I don't want to pour this. Don't also want to drink that that fast. Do some transfer over here. Now I know why I had multiple bottles on here. Multiple bottles, multiple glasses. And you have a glass of bubbly. And most importantly, make sure your bottle's chilled. It's always so important to make sure it doesn't splash and get all over the place and explode. I once had a customer at the wine shop. He came in with an old bottle with Dom Perignon. He put it on the counter and said, this wine's disgusting. Well, oh, okay, what's, what's wrong with it? He said, it's warm, it tastes like vinegar. <laughs> oh, okay, well, may I ask when you opened it or how'd you store it? He said, well, I stored it in my kitchen cabinet above the oven. Well, okay, so mistake one, don't store your wine in someplace warm. And then the next day I said, okay, well then, you know, and he's like, okay. And then I opened it and I said, did you, did you chill it first? And I said, no, I just opened it and exploded all over. Like, oh, okay. And he's like, and then it wasn't good. So I left it out a couple of days, hoping it would get better. He didn't put a stopper on it or anything. He just left it out. And then he said, so it, it's just horrible. Can I find anything better than that? I'm like, oh, well, I think I can help you here. So as long as you chill your bottle down, have something to drink it in, you're fine. You're gonna be okay. Yes, if you wanna be more professional, you can follow other steps, but as long as you do that and you drink it soon enough and you have a stopper like this one and this one here, you're gonna be good. So see, so we have some questions in the chat. Where should we get the new champagne or sparkling wine glasses? I actually go to some secondhand stores oftentimes to get my stemware. I am still a poor college kid um, since I'm going back to school. Um, that's often normally where I get them, but there's also some that aren't that bad online. You can find quite a few. I mean, even these universal glasswares, this is a Gabriel glass, one for all, only $30. It's not, it's really not that expensive and you can get a set. For, for a nice price. I mean, when I was studying for my exam, I went to Crate and Barrel and bought just like a set of 12 flutes because I had a feeling I might break a couple. I only broke one from walking around to the neighborhood. <laughs> had to practice with so many bottles. I bought about mm, a lot of cases and I didn't want to drink all of it. So my neighbors loved me during that time because I would just go, I was the wine fairy during that time, I would go around with a wine cooler and just be like, anyone want free wine? 
it was great. Broke a couple of glasses that way. I was really trying to practice there, but new neighbors moved in. They said, do you do this for everybody? No, I wish I did this all the time. Try, can't always make it happen. Let's see, if you were setting up a mimosa or Bellini station, what do you top juices and nectars? Usually when I drink mimosas or Bellinis, I go mostly sparkling wine and then a little bit of juice. <laughs> Um, but I'm a hippy dippy Bay Area girl, so I always go for something fresh pressed that I got at the farmer's market, whatever is in season. Yeah, James, James, you know what I'm talking about. It's the Bay Area. It's what you do. Hey, we're in California. Great farm vegetable and fruit nearby. Yeah, exactly. I'm like, it's grapefruit season, orange season, wherever you got, fresh squeeze that, and that's exactly what I want. Any recommended brands of stemware? Whatever you got, whatever you like, it's so hard to kind of choose just one. I'm slightly biased since I've worked with a couple stemware companies that I don't want to just call out their names. I've worked with Gabriel Glass and I've worked um, with Karen McNeil who's coming up with a new glassware called the One Ida. Absolutely fantastic. So there are so many places you can get somewhere and so many types. Um, Radial is always a classic. Whatever makes you happy, truly. I mean, especially right now, no one's gonna be judging you by your stemware. They're just gonna be happy you showed up and you're drinking. I mean, you can't see, like you're gonna be like, oh, that's that brand name. You're good. There's so many different ones and everyone kind of has their personal preference. So I'd say, whatever works to you kind of go around. I always like to look, go to restaurants and read, read what they have. If you're looking for something good, find the restaurant you like, go find that wine list you like and go see what they're serving everything out of. $1.99 per glass. That's awesome. Hey, that'll work. And farm store orange juice. Woohoo! Exactly. Kristen, outside of Prosecco and Champagne, what other sparkling wines would you recommend? I could just go through all the empty bottles that are on my table. Not that I've drank all of them. Some of them are so cool. It's been a long pandemic. Um, absolutely love uh, Cremant wine. In fact, here I have a Cremant de Jura. It's absolutely, maybe that's a little too nerdy, but absolutely fantastic. So any sparkling wine made in the traditional method um, located in other regions of France, like Burgundy, Alsace, Loire, absolutely fantastic. I think I got a Cremant de Loire over here. I love all sparkling wine, to be honest. I will kind of play with anything out there. I love Francia Corta from Italy. I love, one of my favorites is this Grand Bec, which is a Cat Cuisse, which is a um, traditional method sparkling wine made in South Africa. Actually, this bottle was Barack Obama, one of Barack Obama's theme, favorite wines. He actually would have this when he would celebrate in his house. So at least I'll approve of that one. So that makes me happy. And I think everyone's favorite, of course, who could not live without the Rosa Regala? It's the holidays, right? They sent some Christmas cookies. I just want to say that the Bampi Foundation sent us a donation today so students are going to get to have scholarships in this pandemic so yay yeah. your Rosa Regale it's good to the Collins College it's perfect for desserts I absolutely love it every time we do the 315 dinner we always pair it with the Rosa Regale and it's it's perfect that's exactly what you want for just like a nice refreshing fruity tooty drink it's perfect what's your favorite California sparkling wine it's just such a hard decision to make. Can I do my Schramsberg. <laughs> I love Schramsberg. I love, love Schramsberg. Okay, top three would be Schramsberg, Domaine Carneros, and Rotor Estate. It's hard to choose just one. I've had the most experience with Domaine Carneros um, just since I've worked with them in the past and being able to try a lot of their aged and vintage wines have been Fantastic, but yes, James, I, I love Schramsberg. It's near and dear to my heart as well. So it's hard to pick just one, but if I can pick my th top three, those, those would be it. Uh, 
I don't know if I'd pair peanut butter with sparkling wine though. Although I do miss the farm store as well. <laughs> I do want to give a shout out. The farm store's open. They're open seven days a week. So if you're in SoCal, please go visit them and, and support them because they're trying to do what they can to keep the campus uh, going. They're, they're, of course, observing all the rules and everything, but they have, I was there last week and they have our Horse Hill Vineyards. And Are there still cases left on sale? Yes. And that okay. was going to the end of the year, Nicole. I'm counting on you. <laughs> it's so important right now. Shop local. I got all of my wines locally at small shops. It's so important right now. Go pair your food with some takeout from your favorite local restaurants. My hometown is known for all of their small mom and pop places. So it's so it's so important to make sure we we support everybody. I just decided to go with the spread of charcuterie board today, mostly because I'm hungry. But I got all of my meats from my local but butcher shop, as well as my cheeses. I have Mount Tam here, the triple cream made in Sonoma delicious so everything local it's the way to do it I'm grateful. so ernie is asking me to send you good wishes and happy holidays he's helping his parents at the moment but he does want to say he's sorry that he missed out he'll watch the recording and happy holidays and he's proud of you he just texts me oh tell him hello back i miss him been weird being away from everybody. It's nice that we've been able to all get together during these and semi see each other. Hi, Johnny. Oh, he disappeared. <laughs> Are you sharing your wine, Kelly? Absolutely. He chose the one we were drinking. Very nice. Yeah. Very nice. Good one. Yeah. It's a family tradition. Yes. <laughs> get to sit on Don. <laughs> I'm so happy to see that the ASAP connection has made the wine connection yes. as well. This co-curricular opportunity makes this professor very happy. You know, I think all hospitality, it all intertwines. It really does. You couldn't have one without the other. Schramsberg with s'mores. Nice. I like that. Ben lives life to the fullest. That's why I like him. <laughs> but like the week before Thanksgiving in a Volkswagen camper and then driving back to LA to work for Thanksgiving, which took like 20 hours, but it was like such a great trip. It was really nice. But Napa was still Napa. <laughs> Kristen, I have to have to ask this. How are you reading the chat without touching anything? I just have it up on the side. On the side. OK. Yeah. I thought, wow, magic. There's somebody there with a sign going. <laughs> this is the next well, question. Well, that would have been a good idea. <laughs> yeah. um, now you know the magic of student assistance again, right? Exactly. <laughs> we all have our magic hacks. We'll figure it out. Been on enough Zoom calls. So I think it's time for dinner. Yeah. I feel that the bubbles have me excited, but it is, uh, you know, definitely. Kristen, are you going to drink all those bottles in front of you this evening? No. Okay. <laughs> she doesn't live alone, fortunately. It is so great to see everybody. And I hope that you all have very safe and happy holidays. And, you know, of course you all, it, this has been a great series. Diana, congratulations. Leah, thank you for supporting. It's really been fun. I'm sorry to have missed Trevor and the beer, but I have to say that uh, in spite of my uh, no camera normally, I have gotten a chance to listen to every single one. And wow, we put out a terrific product. Don't you agree, Leah? I think we really do a great job. Do an awesome job. Absolute best on campus. 
nice to see Thank you. you. There's so much support and it's really great to see all your faces. And I will say that Zoom has provided us a great opportunity to catch up with so many of you and, and you know, see what you're doing and check in and what you're interested in. And this was such a great idea, Leah. I really have, this has probably been one of my favorite things about um, these last few months away. I, I really appreciate it and thank you.